Brilliant. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to those around the world. My name is David Hay. I'm part of the IBM team working out of the UK. And welcome to our virtual Mainframe Z meetup, or Mainframe Z, as we like to say here in the UK. So this is the third virtual meetup we've run. And of course, in the current situation, that's a, a sensible thing to do. But it's building upon a previous set of meetups we run previously, where we're running a face-to-face -face in 2018, 2019, and uh, planned for the first part of 2020. So I'm going to talk to you with you for about seven or eight minutes now, and then I'll hand over to our esteemed panelists. We've got three sessions for you this evening, and we'll jump through the agenda in, in, a, in a few ticks. And towards the end of the session, we'll have a Q&A. So we're planning to run this for about an hour and a half, give or take. So let me kick off. So hopefully you can see my presentation in front of you. That's the welcome slide. So I'm going to move to the second slide. So what is Mainframe Z or Mainframe Z? So what it is, is a community organization. It's not an IBM hosted organization. It is a meetup. It's a partner or so community driven uh, collective of people with a like-minded interest in the IBM Z or IBM Z technology. It's open to all. It's open to IBMers, but of course it's open to our customers, our partners, our business partners, our developers, independent software vendors. Anybody with an interest in the IBM mainframe is part of this community. And it's our intention as the organizing team to make this accessible and available to all and sundry. What we're trying to do is to encourage more people to get more experience and more knowledge of the IBM mainframe platform, recognizing there are some of us who've been working in the profession in the, in the industry for a long time, but equally, there are people working in my team in Hursley who've been in the, in the profession for less than a year. We've got work, people working with us who are apprentices, who are graduates, who are yet to graduate, who are working on the IBM mainframe platform. So part of the objective of this meetup and these virtual meetups and the face-to-face -face meetups when we get back to normal is to encourage more people to get more involved. And part of that is to allow or enable people to understand what mainframe is and to understand that it's more than just what you might have seen in a movie 20, 30, 40 years ago. The world has moved on and the mainframe platform has moved on. So what have we got? We've got an organizing team who are mostly, but not all, IBMers. So the initial uh, organizing team is a relatively small team back in the 2018, got together to put together the first mainframe Z meetup event. Initially, we were focused upon London. London seems to be a really good hub in the UK for people with interest in and access to mainframe technology. So we kicked this off initially. It was the mainframe Z on the, on the meetup service. It's the London um, chapter, as it were, London organization. But again, in these interesting times in which we live, we're recognizing that we can do this. We can do virtual events, which means we can open this up. We can and should open this up to the entire world. So this is one of the benefits, small benefit perhaps, one of the benefits of the situation of running these virtual meetups. Also, it means we can run them on a more regular basis. So the organizing team, as I mentioned, is people mostly working out of IBM here in the UK. You notice from the faces, most of them, unlike my good self, are young people. So part of the objective has been met in that IBM is building a community inside IBM of people starting their careers, developing experience on the mainframe, mainframe platform. And what we're looking to do is to share what we have discovered, but enable a community to build up around this idea of adoption, of encouraging more people to get more involved in the IBM mainframe platform. So how do, we, how do you find us now? You're here with us today. You're either watching live or you're watching this as a recording. So again, welcome. We're online, as is everybody. So we have the meetup page itself, which is how you found this event, which is the bit.ly link on the left-hand side. We also make heavy use of Slack, and I'll talk about Slack a little bit further in terms of ongoing engagement. But Slack is the channel for the communication. So everything we're doing today, all of the organizational the interaction with our speakers and with our organizing panel with the hosts has all been done through Slack. and of course slack is beneficial in that it's open to all 
it's not an IBM internal tool. Anybody can become part of that particular Slack team. We're on LinkedIn because, again, LinkedIn is the place people go to make connections and to develop experience and expertise, and therefore having access to a pool of existing and new talent. LinkedIn is the perfect opportunity, or gives us the perfect opportunity to reach out and embrace people who are yet to join in the IBM mainframe community. And then finally, of course, we have presence on Twitter because Twitter is a good way of notifying the world as to what's going on in the context of the main Z organization. So we're posting out there as much as we can on all four of those channels to make sure that we can reach as many people as possible. So how can you get involved? So you're watching, you're listening, you're participating in what we're doing right now, which is fantastic, but would you like to be involved more? We'd love you to be involved more. And as I said before, this is a community-led organization. This is not an IBM um, only internal event. This has to be run by the community. If it's only run by IBM as a vendor, then we're missing a trick. So if you're interested in getting involved in any one of those roles as an organizer, as a sponsor, as a speaker, as a recruiter. Now, again, it's, it's a little difficult to do recruit right now, but when we get back to normal and we can get back to having face-to-face -face events as well as virtual events, recruiters may have interest in coming along to find out, A, what we do, what it's done, but B, talk to candidates who are interested in working in the mainframe profession and vice versa. People looking to start their careers within the mainframe profession may use the meter, may use mainframe as Z as that on ramp, as that way of getting involved. So if you would like to get involved, reach out. And again, Slack is the place to go. And I'll talk about that towards the end of the session, but when we wrap up with the, I'll post the QA. So we have an agenda. We have three specific speakers, three um, valuable speakers with a lot of experience in the community. So this event is very much focused upon COBOL, in part because COBOL has got a lot of PR, a lot of press recently, mainly in a good way, in terms of recognising there is a skills gap in general across all of IT. But there's also a specific skills gap around COBOL. So we're looking to make sure we can embrace as many people as possible with an interest in getting involved in COBOL. So I'll hand over shortly to Wolfram, who will talk about mainframe modernization. He'll run for around 30 minutes or so. We'll then pass across to Robert talking about writing COBOL programs for Kicks. And then towards the end of our session, we'll have Will talking about creating an open source uh, COBOL training course. So the last two sessions should be about 15 minutes apiece, which takes us up to around an hour's worth of content. But there's more. At around um, 1840 my time, so one hour's time or so, we will move into an open mic Q and A session, but again, I'll cover that once we've had the formal speakers. So what I'm going to do now is, hopefully, by the magic of technology, hand over to Wolfram. So bear with me one second. Okay. Yeah. Hi all, and thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, speak and the presentation at the um, um, UK meetup. I'm uh, looking forward for this presentation very much, and I just want to go through a few foils to present you the idea of mainframe modernization. A few words to me, I'm a mainframer since 1976, so I have uh, 44 years of mainframe know-how uh, on the uh, yeah, experience with mainframes. I don't go in each and every uh, point now, I just want to mention two, uh, I think, important uh, activities uh, I'm involved. I'm the president of the Central Europe CMG, the Computer Measurement Group. And in this uh, Computer Measurement Group, we have a uh, working group uh, called uh, Enterprise uh, Transformation. And it, uh, of course, it also has to do with uh, modernization of mainframe environments. And we had an uh, event uh, in March this year where we had uh, IBM and LC Labs of Switzerland on stage to discuss their different uh, ideas. And uh, it, was, it was a very nice event. And the second uh, I want to mention here is uh, that I'm the president of the Academic Mainframe Consortium. It's a consortium in uh, Germany where we foster mainframe education at academic institutions. 
So uh, we have in uh, Germany in between three locations, universities who have mainframes uh, at their location and also do education uh, to bring up new blood to the mainframe. This is the main idea uh, I'm involved uh, during the last many years. And in between, I work for the uh, European Mainframe Academy and we are a commercial education company to bring new blood, new mainframers up and uh, working on mainframes. Okay, now today I uh, want to talk about mainframe modernization. It's an introductory presentation I uh, did uh, on, and will do in, in uh, uh, also in future uh, at a three-day course we offer in Germany called uh, mainframe modernization. And the idea is to give the big picture about mainframe modernization. I'm already started with the introduction and so I want to show a few foils uh, how in the past we had the history from monolithic uh, um, applications via client server applications and today a lot of is talked about uh, microservices and how to organize and manage microservices. Then I do a switch to virtualization uh, because virtualization is necessary to uh, control microservices uh, as example and uh, I will give you a short overview uh, about virtualization uh, in general and then virtual machines and then what are containers because to manage microservices and modern environments you need to have uh, container environments and you have to manage these containers. And the last foil will be a big picture about many, many tools that are available today also on mainframes, especially on Linux on mainframes, but not only on Linux with uh, uh, tools and uh, things you have to organize for controlling the software development lifecycle. It also has to do with uh, DevOps. Okay, let's start with the uh, history, uh, monolithic applications we had in the past. We had our thumb uh, terminal and uh, we have an interface between terminal and the application and uh, this was the uh, 3270 interface. Um, maybe you can imagine uh, on this thumb terminal, COBOL was developed and uh, an application was developed as the application in many cases in the past was a monolithic application without differentiating between different parts of the application. Sometimes there were an, uh, an interface was used between the application and the data and uh, this is SQL. It is of course still in place and in the past this was mainly done with embedded SQL uh, uh, instructions within a an, an, an monolithic application. And uh, afterwards uh, client server came up and uh, with client servers, a monolithic application was divided into different uh, <coughs> parts. We have uh, the presentation part, we have the business logic part, we have the data management part. And uh, I want to concentrate now on the business logic part because this is most important part when it comes to modern application. And it started with the basic idea uh, bringing business logic together. In the past, we had uh, logical unit 6.2. Many don't know it today. In the past, it was also called uh, APPC, Advanced Program to Program Communication. And in between, we don't uh, use, uh, of course, uh, logical units anymore. It's an SNA term, System Network arch Architecture term. In between, we work with sockets. And building on sockets, we have a lot of uh, techniques that today are used. As example, HTTP, as example, RPC, RMI, CORBA, uh, then uh, service-oriented architectures with web services and microservices. And the uh, most modern things uh, were, uh, <coughs> are in place today is uh, RESTful interfaces and uh, JSON. And I want to give a short introduction, uh, just uh, a few words about RPC, not because it's very important, but to understand what is necessary to bring different pieces together. And if uh, we think about uh, remote procedure calls, <coughs> let's see, the acronym RPC stands for remote procedure calls. And in the past, we had a program and the program had functional parts and did some instructions and afterwards uh, uh, sub program or function or however you call it is uh, called 
and uh, the control is given to the uh, sub program or function. Function is uh, worked through and afterwards it returns and return means get back to program A and continue your work. This is normal procedure calls, functional um, things to, to uh, uh, divide an application into different functions. And now RPC, remote procedure call means we have an, uh, <clears throat> a wall between these two programs and this can be on different platforms. And now let's imagine we have one part of the uh, application is written on a Unix system in uh, C and the other part we want to call as example uh, runs on a mainframe and is programmed in COBOL. And what we need in this um, uh, in such an environment where we uh, go over different platforms, we have some um, mechanism in, to have in place to, to uh, uh, get the communication up and running. It means we have to have an interface def definition language to tell what, uh, as example, what arguments we are passing to program B and what is coming back on the return. So just to give you an overview of what is necessary to do in such uh, environments. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, we have a synchronous communication, means system and application must already be up and running. Uh, the process A is blocked as long as uh, process B is uh, running. These are some disadvantages of this kind of architecture. And now I want to go further on with not so much deta details. I just uh, um, told about RPC. So RME, Remote Method inv uh, Invocation, is a similar idea like RPCs. But now we are getting into the idea of uh, object-oriented programming and RME per, by definition, uh, RME uh, is a Java technology. So if we have Java programs on the one side of the uh, um, application and uh, also Java on the other side, then we can uh, use RMI for a communication. And the big advantage of RMI in this case is that we don't need the interface definition language because when we, uh, as example, um, um, set up uh, integer variable to, to uh, pass to a program B, it's uh, in Java defined and in both uh, places, it's the same, uh, uh, has the same maximum, maximum length and so on. So we don't need to have an uh, IDL. Then Corba <clears throat> came up. Corba is not too much in place uh, in between. It was uh, maybe 15 years ago, Corba was very heavily used. I know a lot of uh, um, customers, especially in Switzerland, who used uh, Corba as the technology. And uh, Corba, again, is object-oriented uh, technology. And uh, without the, the uh, uh, problem of um, uh, RPC, but again, we have to uh, have an idea. So we have a special Corba IDL to uh, define the definitions. So Corba is not no longer in place uh, today. And uh, what is now coming up and is more modern is uh, so service-oriented architecture, web services, and microservices. Let's have a look at uh, uh, SOA. SOA means uh, service-oriented architecture. And in many cases, it's not necessarily so, but in many cases, it used SOAP. So uh, is a um, um, communication idea. Abbreviation is no longer a meaning, but so is used as an XML-based protocol consists of three parts, an envelope to describe the content and what is uh, passed between uh, the, um, uh, the uh, interfaces, rules and definition of data types, and conventions to represent something like RPCs and responses. And the problem of uh, SOAP uh, is that it's, uh, um, as I already said, it's XML based. And uh, there is a lot of, of uh, uh, information uh, going up uh, to define what we want to do and how we want to do it. Let's uh, check it with a 
uh, think a short um, <clears throat> presentation of what is a SOAP request. And here you see what we want to have in this case. We want to get, uh, as example, the uh, stock exchange rate for the IBM uh, uh, share. And uh, the only thing that is really important we want to, to transport in when we want uh, the, the, uh, the value back from is the uh, um, <coughs> stock rate for uh, IBM, the, the uh, share value. And a lot of information is needed to uh, set uh, to, to do this SOAP request. And the same is true for the response. So what we want as a response, we want to have the share value of the uh, IBM uh, shares. And in this case, again, a lot of SOAP uh, XML information around this uh, value we want to get back. And the really important thing we want to get back is the, in this case, the $108.53. Uh, it's the, the value we want to get back. And uh, then it came up because uh, a lot of uh, yeah, things that have to describe these uh, um, Request and uh, responses. Um, the idea came up uh, from uh, Fielding, Fielding's doctoral dissertation, um, talked about represent representational state transfer. And the idea uh, of uh, this uh, technology was isn't there a lighter possibility than uh, the idea of uh, SOAP? And the idea now of RESTful interfaces is to uh, do get, post, put, delete. So the things we want to have normally to uh, 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 use normal HTTP interfaces. And these interfaces can be run as uh, so-called CRUD uh, HTTP methods. And CRUD stands for creation of an object, uh, reading, uh, reading of an object, updating of an object, and deleting of an object. And many formats are supported, and most of them uh, in fact, uh, uh, XML or JSON in this case. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And now, such a request uh, looks uh, very smaller and uh, uh, <clears throat> much more efficient. We just uh, given an, uh, an URL and uh, the, the uh, interface we want to use and tell uh, via this URL we want to have the stock exchange rate from the IBM share. And the response, very similar, is also very, uh, very small. <clears throat> okay, so web services, microservices, uh, some call it, we do uh, IT the Unix way. And the Unix way means uh, the, the programs that we, uh, uh, we design should do really just one thing, and this thing should be done well. Now I do a break and bring this afterwards together to virtualization because to, to deal with microservices and uh, in fact uh, when we uh, design microservices we really have a lot of small programs to control and uh, to, to manage and in this case we need some kind of virtualization. And this is a big picture of IBM C virtualization techniques. It starts and started <clears throat> with logical partitions. Logical partitions uh, is the idea of uh, dividing a physical machine into logical machines. And within such a logical partition, we can have other uh, virtualization techniques based on software, as example, CVM, virtual machine. And uh, the newer technology that's also available is KVM, the kernel-based virtual machine. And above, within these virtual machines, we can have, as example, a lot of Linux uh, uh, machines up and running. And within Linux, we can, again, do further virtualization with uh, Docker containers. And I try now, uh, uh, I try to give you some ideas of how many uh, virtual machines we have in a typical environment. So let's start with a physical machine. This is an IBM C15. And uh, in, with this uh, IBM C15, we can have, have, as an example, 10 logical partitions defined. It's not too much. It's a, I think it's a, a reasonable value for having 10 logical partitions on uh, a quite big 
physical machine. And within such a logical partition, we can now virtualize this uh, software. As example, doesn't matter if it's uh, CVM or if it's KVM, it's just the virtual machines. And as example, we can have in each and every LPA within uh, such configuration, we can have, as example, up to 100 virtual machines virtualized by software by uh, CVM or by KVM. And now the next step is within such a VM, we can have a lot of uh, <clears throat> containers and containers means it's small uh, and, and uh, um, virtualization techniques where we can virtualize applications. And this is done with microservices. And as example, in each and every container, uh, each and every virtual machine, we can have up to just an example, 1200 containers, also a reasonable number. And in the whole afterwards, we have to manage 1 million and 200,000 containers. And that is why we need also a new infrastructure to, uh, um, to manage such a, a complex environment. So this is why uh, containers came up and uh, as example, just an example, Docker came up and uh, Docker is now one idea to, to set up containers uh, normally within Linux environments, but maybe you know it already, not just in Linux environments, we see a CCX, CX, it's now also possible to have uh, Docker environments within the COS system, means Linux applications and Linux infrastructures within our uh, classic uh, COS uh, environment. <clears throat> And uh, now the, uh, also the, the term and idea of DevOps come up because uh, uh, Docker and the idea of containers is uh, one possibility to have a standard format uh, between development and operations and uh, bringing these different uh, things uh, together. And uh, to manage such an environment, uh, we have to have a look on the software development lifecycle. And there in between, we have really a lot of different tools available to manage such an environment. And these tools are also av available, especially when we use uh, Linux on mainframes. And now comes the uh, foil, the slide. Uh, giving an uh, overview of uh, these different uh, tools uh, and utilities we can use to manage such a complex virtualized environment with new technologies, with web services, with restful interfaces and so on. And in this case, as example, to manage such an environment, we need, as example, uh, Kubernetes, uh, you sh uh, surely have uh, heard of. When we go to the uh, development part, as example, we uh, can use uh, Git for uh, software control mechanisms. And as example, in between, we also can use Git in a COS environment. It can be installed in Unix system services and we also can use with uh, Git within COS. And some com uh, companies already do that. I know it as example from one of the biggest mainframe customers in, uh, in the world, it's Walmart who uses uh, Git and this kind of <coughs> stuff really, really very, very heavily. There are other tools and the idea now is behind these uh, icons, you can just uh, click on such an icon and get to the, uh, the website of these uh, tools. So if you want to have a look at Kubernetes, we just click on Kubernetes and maybe you don't see it because I just shared the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint, but uh, now you get, I see now directly the uh, Kubernetes website. And all these icons uh, are set up with the URL behind it to the website. So afterwards we can use these foils to get to these different, uh, um, <clears throat> different tools. Okay, maybe I was now a little too fast, but this was the idea of my presentation. Any questions, any remarks up, up to this point? Wonderful, great stuff. Okay, so I hand over to Robert. Robert, it's all yours. Thank you. There we go. Took me a while to find the right button. Well, thank you, Wolfram. That was an awful lot of material to cover in a short period of time, and you did a really good job on it. Um, okay, we're going to talk a little bit about COBOL and what it was like in the early years. 
Uh, my name is, nope. why is it not working? It is not advancing for me. There we go. <clears throat> my name is Robert Garrett. I live in Texas, in case you can't tell by the sound of my voice. Uh, I started out at the same time Wolfram did. I started out in 1976 as an operator. I moved into applications programming. I quite literally hacked my way into, into systems programming. That's another story. Uh, I've worked on everything from DOS VS to ZOS to VM, SNA, even AIX, although I try to keep that a secret. I've uh, been working with CICS since uh, CICS DOS version 1.1.2 back in the 70s, which was two versions before uh, command level was introduced. I've worked in big shops, small shops, uh, everything from one or two person staffs to uh, one company that had more than 2,000 active CICS reasons up and running at the same time. I've been an employee, I've been an independent consultant. I love it all, I love the mainframe. I'm definitely a mainframe bigot. Uh, right now I have uh, my own kind of consulting enterprise I'm trying to get going. So if anybody needs some help, give me a holler. So back in the beginning, uh, every CICS API call required some steps. You had to obtain the address of the current tasks TCA because that was your interface for communicating with the CICS main task. You had to build a parameter list inside that TCA that represented the call that, or the function that you wanted to accomplish. Then you had to get the address of the appropriate service module to handle that function out of the CICS CSA. And then you had to do what was essentially a call to that routine which is the way every CICS uh, API call was invoked. And there were requirements for what they called quasi reentrancy which means that the program was not permitted to modify itself. But if it did modify itself, it had to put everything back exactly like it was between CICS calls. And also at that time, CICS did not automatically create a copy of, of what was the equivalent of your COBOL working storage section at the time. You had to handle that all yourself. And all the macro calls, all the CICS API, API calls looked like assembler macros because they were assembler macros. And all of that was a pretty good trick to pull off in COBOL at the time because COBOL at that time had no facilities for dealing with anything having to do with addressing. You couldn't store addresses, you couldn't update addresses, you couldn't uh, directly uh, reference memory. It was all built into the language. So pulling this off at the time was a pretty good trick considering that COBOL didn't support it. Well, the guys who built CICS, and I, and I can't have enough good to say about the CICS team, that, that's the one team inside IBM that from my point of view at least, has always really had their act together. What they did at the time to make all this work for COBOL was really genius. Uh, every application program that's running inside CICS essentially is a sub-program to CICS. It gets called by kicks and passed some addresses. And in COBOL, we know that we address those kinds of things via the linkage section. And so what they did where they managed to find out how to take the COBOL TGT, the task global table, and make a copy of it. Now inside that task global table was where COBOL stores address pointers, such as addresses to the various linkage section items that a subprogram was called. And so the very first item in your linkage section was a definition to your program's own BLL cells, which were the address cells that were used to reference linkage section items. What the IBM did, team did at the time was they exposed those cells to the call, to the call program so that it could manipulate those. So whenever you coded a COBOL program to work with the macro level API, in your linkage section, the very first thing that you would always code would be an O1 level for your, all of your BLL cells. And the first entry in it was a pointer that pointed to itself. And then you had a, a binary field corresponding to each O1 COBOL level that you had defined in the linkage section. 
Two things that were always required was a definition of the CICS CSA. Not like it is today where IBM has got links to try to hide that and keep people out of it. Uh, the way that application programming worked at the time with the macro level interface was not only was it not hidden, you actually had to address it and had to reference things in it in order to use it. Uh, also true for the TCA. And then beyond that, you would make a uh, uh, another linkage section item for your own program's working storage. It wasn't like things are now with the command level interface where they always would make a copy of that and address it for you. You had to handle that for yourself. And so the requirements were that you had to code a, an O1 level that defined all of your BLL cells to address all the various data, uh, data areas and storage areas that your program was going to need to work. So the way a typical COBOL program looked was you'd have working storage, of course, but the only thing you would use that for was constants and literals. You never modified that because that stayed resident in your load module and was shared by every task that was working through your program. And so in, this, in that sense, that part of your program at least had to meet the requirements for being fully reentered. Then in your linkage section, you had the address cells that you used to reference everything else. And there was a one-for-one -one correspondence between every cell and every O1 level in your linkage section. That's the way you address them. And so inside your procedure division, there was another verb that was specific for CICS that was added to the COBOL language called service reload. And that was how you told the compiler to reload the address cell or the address register that got loaded from the BLL cell to be sure that your addressing was always current whenever an address changed. So the first thing that would happen would be you'd have to establish addressability to your own TCA. You would have to issue a get main request to get some storage for you to to use for a copy or an equivalent of your working storage section and then go from there. So you can see there uh, on the move 4096, that was a direct update to one of the parameter fields in the TCA for storage control where you would tell storage control how much storage you wanted to obtain. Every CICS call that you issued out of a macro level program would look something like this. It, you would have calls to storage control, file control, uh, <laughs> interval control for timer type requests, whatever you were doing, you had to create a, a macro call that looked like that. Well, of course, this with all this looked was something like this. The area in the green would be a copy of COBOL TGT that the CICS system would make. Create, copy your BLL cells out there along with your program save area. The, uh, your task TCA would be the area where the communications would take place between your application and the various CIC service routines. There is also a pointer in that TCA to the location of that copied PGT. Whenever you would make a COBOL call, you would you would, uh, to a CICS service module, you'd have to prime that TCA with parameters that were appropriate for the type of call you were making. Then the call would, would fetch the address of the appropriate service routine from the CSA and link to it. So that's the way all that worked. And again, this is pretty amazing considering that COBOL at the time had no support for anything having to do with addressing. I, I can't say enough about how smart this was. Okay, so, but I mentioned before that we were coding assembler macros in a COBOL program. Well, of course, the COBOL compiler doesn't understand that. So we had to have some way to compile and execute and link a, a, a COBOL program with CICS. Again, too, this is something that they pulled off that was pretty smart. Compiling and linking a COBOL program in those days three separate steps, not including the linkage editor step. The first thing that happened would be you would send your source program through the COBOL preprocessor, and all it did was it would read your, your uh, COBOL source program and search for things that looked like COBOL statements, uh, data definition statements, uh, levels, linkage section items, procedure division statements, 
and it would encapsulate all those inside uh, of an assembler punch command so that if you ran it through assembler, it would just get re uh, reproduced. But it did not alter any of the any of the macro calls, the DFHSC, DFHICP, DFHKC, whatever you call those that passed through untouched. So then the next step was you took the output of that and ran that into the assembler. So what happens when the assembler ran is it would encounter those punch statements that had your encapsulated COBOL code in it, and they would just get reproduced and punched out to uh, the same input data set. But, but the macro statements that had been passed through untouched would reference a syslab expansion uh, that was specific for COBOL that would take those assembler macros and would resolve them into the logic to update the CSA, uh, I, I'm sorry, update the, the task control area, the TCA with the, uh, with the parameters, go fetch the location of the appropriate service module from the uh, CSA and then invoke the service module via COBOL call. And so it, these macros would get expanded into the COBOL equivalent of what it took to accomplish those macro calls. And then and once all that had been done, then you fed all that through the COBOL compiler, which things would get compiled as normal, and then that, that went into the linkage, uh, linkage editor for creating the load module. So it was creative the way they did that. They made it possible for dumb old VS COBOL to uh, work with dynamic addressing, including get many in uh, Freeman operations and be a good citizen in the CICS environment, which meant adhering to all the rules of being quasi reentrant. So back in uh, 1.3 on, on DOS VS, there's been some discussion about when the command level interface actually came out. I'm, I first saw it on 1.3 uh, running under DOS. And at that time, when the command level interface came out, underneath the covers, the way it worked was all of the CICS commands got sent to a prefix module that would interpret the command and translate them into the equivalent of uh, the macro level interface. And so underneath the covers, everything was actually still running macro. The uh, command level interface was a sort of a dynamic preprocessor at runtime that would re-engineer all that stuff. Beginning with KickCSA version three, this got reversed. This was when the, the domain uh, architecture that we're all so familiar with now inside CICS, this was when that came along and that got reversed and the command level interface became the native interface in CICS and it was the macro code that had to be translated if you still used it. Macro was still supported for uh, assembler up through KickCSA 3.1.1 and it was dropped for everything in Kick CSA 3.2. In 1996, CICS was rebranded and renamed and, and became Kick's Transaction Server 1.1 .1 in 1996. So that was a little bit confusing for some folks. But if you look at the internal CICS release, there is a, a three digit uh, internal release that they used to track the code. That has remained contiguous. So uh, Kix TS55, which is the current GA56 is going GA maybe sometime later this year, uh, is internal release 720. So if you're working with uh, the code, you kind of have to pay attention to which release number you're talking about there. But now in the command level API, uh, your working storage section of the COBOL program is automatically made a copy and made uh, a task specific copy of it. So you don't have to worry about that for reinterested programmers. You can now um, have, have verbs in the COBOL language, some of them now that are available to you where you, you can do addressing type things. And it's not too tough now these days to build COBOL code that's not only quasi reentrant and meets the original requirements for CICS, but you can also write thread safe and even fully reentrant code if you set the appropriate uh, compiler options. Uh, current Kix versions continue to support traditional languages, but you can also write Java in CICS now, including Liberty Profile, PHP, Rex, Node.js, 
and all sorts of things. And not only that, but all of these different languages can interoperate with each other. You can have a Java program calling a COBOL program, calling a Node program, however you want to do it. So there's a lot of folks that say or have taken the position that, well, gee, the mainframe is old. And because it's old, it must not be good anymore. But what these people don't stop to think about is how do you get to be old? Look at the smartphone that you probably have in your hand or available to you. If you have a smartphone that's even a year old, these days it's probably hopelessly obsolete. You can't wait for the next version to come out. How does something like a computer get to be as old as the mainframe and the mainframe architecture is and still be viable after what, the 1960s or earlier? How does something get to be that old if it wasn't done right? So just because it's old doesn't mean it's not serviceable. And also it's not the same old mainframe that you're used to, especially in the, in the uh, aspect of the code and the systems that run on it. Does can you continue to evolve? So story time. So back in the uh, 1980s, 1990s, I worked for a consulting company and we got involved in a project for a telemarketing firm. Yeah, one of those companies that calls you in the middle of the night or right just when you're sitting down to supper and, and they can be quite irritating. We got engaged to build an application for a marketing company. And, and as it worked out with our availability and everything at the time, I did that project single handedly. I didn't have any help on it. So the goal was to create a predictive dialing system. And in case you don't know, I know I didn't know at the time, uh, the way a telemarketing business works is their success rate and their sales rate has nothing to do with how glib a representative is or how friendly he is on the phone or any of that. Their results are directly tied to how many phone calls can they make in an hour. That's all that matters to them. That's how they get their results done. And the way these companies work is they contract out to other firms that want to mount a telemarketing campaign. Uh, they will be hired and the client company will provide them with lists of names and contact information about the product that they want to sell and, and the uh, inventory of all the phone calls they want them to make. And then the marketing company makes those calls. Well, traditionally the way that works is they have these giant phone switches and, and a big room, you know, with several hundred people sitting at desks and they're doing nothing for the entire time they're at work and dialing phone numbers and trying to talk to people based on the information that they have in front of them uh, on their terminal as they're, so they can talk to folks and know their name and know a little bit about them and, and pretend that they actually know them when they don't. Well, a lot of the time uh, when these agents are trying to contact people, They'll dial a number and they'll get a busy signal or it won't be a good number or no one will answer. So all that time is wasted time. So the goal of a predictive dialing system is to eliminate that time. So the project that I designed and built for them, and this was all done in COBOL under CICS, was this. They had a phone switch, a big Rockwell phone switch. I think it was even more powerful than the mainframe they were running on at the time. It was the 4381 that they would load an inventory of calls into and each agent would log into their uh, station at the desk and would start punching buttons and every time they'd punch a button the switch would make a phone call and then they would have to wait for whatever happened well what a predictive dialer does is we give control for making the phone calls over to the switch itself it's it's not dependent on an agent saying i'm ready what would happen in the case of a predictive dialer would be that an agent sits at his desk, he puts on his headset, and he logs in and says, I'm available. And then the switch starts making phone calls. It will, and whenever it gets a connection with a live person, the phone switch has uh, hardware on it that allows it to discern between a live person or a busy signal or anything that's other than a live person and act accordingly then it will connect that uh, phone call to the agent at the desk. 
Well, after a period of time, the switch is gathering statistics and it begins to construct a profile so that it knows how many phone calls it has to make in order to get a live answer. It knows how to start discarding the, uh, the, the non, non-live person calls. And then it does what we call, it goes into predictive mode. It will dial ahead knowing that every agent on the floor is currently engaged on a phone call. It's also keeping stats about how long an agent talks to someone on person uh, on average. And so what it does is it makes phone calls, it dials ahead, and it's betting that by the time it gets the next connect, one of the agents will be free, and it will pick that free agent and route the phone call uh, into that agent. And so the experience that the agent has is he's just on phone call after phone call after phone call. He has no dead time. As soon as he gets off the uh, phone with some with one person, the next phone call shows up in his ear. Well, my job as, a, as the application was whenever a, uh, the phone switch would get a connection, it would cut a record that would tell me, hey, I just connected this call for this customer to this agent. So it gave me those three pieces of information that it had a connection, what the phone number was that it had dialed, and which agent it had routed the call to. My job was to hit the database, go find out the information on that particular prospect, and pop that information up on the screen in front of the agent that we just sent the call to, so that when he could talk to the guy, he wouldn't sound like an idiot. He'd know his name and could kind of pretend like he knew the guy and, and call him by name and, and tell him some, whatever information that the uh, client company had collected about this particular prospect would be available to the agent. Hey, Rob. Yes. Sorry to, sorry to interject, but we're starting to run down towards the end of your slot. Any chance we can bring this to a bit of a close and then maybe cover the Q&A? Yeah, I'm, I'm almost there. I'm almost done. <clears throat> so what would happen would be... Uh, we were eliminating the downtime. So when this thing was humming, we had a floor of 350 agents that were just taking phone calls one after another. And I built this whole system actually on my laptop running with Realia Cobol, Realia CICS. I built it on a PC, uploaded it to the mainframe and installed it and ran it. So years later, they tried to convert that system to Unix after I got, had, had, had uh, passed it on. And they didn't really understand the mechanisms of CICS, particularly the temp storage service, which is a very high speed interactive data facility inside kits. So they tried to replace that with just regular old Unix file IO. I ran into the guy on the street some years after that, asked him how the project went. And he said, well, yeah, we converted it. But you remember how we were supporting 350 agents, that thing was just humming along. Well, the Unix version died on the vine with 10 people on it. So the mainframe is a pretty powerful machine. Anyway, I'll turn loose of it now. And uh, if I can get back to my WebEx, I will do that and hand that over. Or can you switch for me? Yeah, we'll switch for you, Robert. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm switch across to Will, but please stay around because we'll have a Q&A session in about 15 minutes or so. So over to you, Mr. Yates. Cool. Thank you very much. So uh, for the next 15 minutes or so, I am going to tell you a little story about how I and a couple of far more intelligent, far more capable people um, across the globe built a open source COBOL training course. And this COBOL training course was a solution. And for it to be a solution, it needed to be a problem. So what was the problem? So the problem was a perceived lack in COBOL skills across the world. Um, this is an article I did a little bit of searching and I found an article quite quickly um, with obviously a picture of a punch card machine because uh, you can't have an article about COBOL without having a large black and white picture of a man stood in front of a large nondescript machine. And this article is actually taken from 2017. So completely separate to the um, issues and the concerns that we have in 2020. But back in 2017, there was still a perceived shortage of COBOL developers and people complaining or worried 
that where is the next generation of COBOL um, developers going to come from? And they, the author mentions that COBOL isn't as sexy as working with Elixir or Golang. Well, I'd argue that it probably is, but it's definitely not as new or as funky as those languages. But it also goes on to say, if you've been trained on a Windows platform with something like Visual Studio Code, why would you want to go back to the mainframe? But is this problem, is this concern just limited to the IT industry and limited to COBOL? So I went back to my browser and had another search. And I found lots of articles. I was swimming in articles all about different levels of skill shortages. One there at the bottom uh, about the cybersecurity industry, apparently lacking uh, 4 million uh, people skilled in doing cybersecurity. So, okay, there's an issue there. Is it an issue that is uh, isolated to the IT industry? Well, in the top corner, nope you'll see that Dulux apparently is stating, so Dulux bill uh, make uh, paint and uh, make it, it's a paint brand, says that the UK has a shortage of people who know how to hold a paintbrush and paint a wall. So it's not an issue that's just related to COBOL, and it's not a rela uh, issue that's just related to the IT industry. In fact, if you search about literally going to Google and put any type of um, industry or any type of um, job profession and skills shortage. And I can pretty much guarantee you'll get hits. But then of course, in 2020, as we know, the world kind of changed and the coronavirus hit and the term COBOL and the programming language COBOL suddenly became newsworthy again. And the biggest news article was um, from the state of New Jersey, where Phil Murphy issued a call to say, we need 60, um, sorry, we need volunteers who know how to code in COBOL, because it's a old language, it's an ancient language, and we need people that can actually um, understand it and, and help us out. And they were calling for volunteers. And this made headline news across the world. The term COBOL, suddenly became a hot topic once again. But if you look a little bit deeper and have a look at uh, this article that was from Wired magazine, they were saying, don't necessarily go ahead and blame COBOL. Yes, um, if you're from a media perspective, you hear that, um, oh, the, the reason that New Jersey are in trouble is because they've got systems that are running on a old ancient mainframe using old ancient COBOL languages. It's not a big hop to say that, well, it's the old mainframe and generally the old COBOL language that's the problem. But it's quite easy to make that, make that jump. But experts were actually saying that the problem probably wasn't in just the COBOL code. A lot of the screenshots, a lot of the evidence that was coming back was showing that perhaps it may have been in other parts of the enterprise. Actually, the COBOL bit was working well. But across the globe, the term COBOL, skill shortage, and needing people to know how to write COBOL was becoming vogue again. Um, all the cool kids were suddenly wanting to pick up COBOL rather than Go or Elixir or Golang. This was cool times. And IBM had already started building a response. We already knew there was issues with COBOL programmers, but in this specific instance, there were people that needed COBOL help and COBOL training straight away. And Barry Baker, the senior, so the vice president of IBM's Z software said, well, we've worked out where the hotspots are and we're assisting as best we can to help those uh, companies of those groups. But also went on to say, well, with the open mainframe project, IBM is trying to build a call, uh, a, a project proposal to actually say, can we create a COBOL course and make it available to everyone to teach people how to write COBOL and to start to build those skills. And so that's what IBM, alongside the um, American River College and the Open Mainframe Project actually went away and did. And we started to pull together a plan to build a COBOL programming course that would be supported by the Open Mainframe Project and made available to the entire world for free. And here I've got a picture of, on the left-hand side, the little group of us who got together to do this. So you've got representatives from IBM, um, from our Red Books group. You've also got representatives from some of our clients and from the American River College. And I was due to be one of those people. 
And the plan was to spend four weeks in Sacramento, in California, um, on a all expenses paid trip to go and write a book about COBOL. Now I couldn't make the first week because I was at Share the week before. So I was gonna spend a week at home and then I was due to fly out to uh, Sacramento. Um, I had my plane tickets in my hand and ready to go. And then global travel stopped and you're not going to Sacramento anymore, but we still want to write a book. We still want to produce the course in the same deadline that we had. Let's still go for it. Let's still produce this, this, this course. So with the glories of Slack and WebEx and emails and Git and other um, sharing um, sites and collaboration sites, we still worked forward to create this COBOL course. So the course is uh, split roughly into two parts. Part one is about the tooling because it was important to us that we showed people that COBOL, not just as a language and as a syntax and it's um, inert and efficiencies. It was also a language in which you could have a very good experience in writing the code itself. So we brought in things like uh, VS Code, which is a um, an open editor made available um, by Microsoft, and it's a freely available tool. And there's an awful lot of extensions that you can use and you can plug into it to make your experience better. So we took VS Code. We took the open mainframe project Zoe to give us some um, mainframe connectivity. And we used the IBM Open Editor, which is an extension for VS Code to allow you to get syntax highlighting, code completion, um, searching capabilities, refactoring capabilities for IBM's enterprise languages, COBOL, of course, being one of them. So we built all these things together. We also pulled in um, IBM Developer for System Z and also included some tutorials around ISPF, because even though a lot of this stack is freely available, uh, especially Zoe, VS Code, and the IBM Open Editor, we understood that some people may have only have ISPF or only have access to ISPF, and those people should be able to follow along with the tutorial as well. But this meant for the first time, we could actually put together a set of tools and deliver them or um, have them already delivered in the open source space pull them together and explain to people how to use them to learn COBOL. So they didn't feel that they were stepping back into the 1960s while trying to learn this new language. Part two of the course was all about the COBOL language. So we go through the basics of COBOL. We talk about the different divisions, the data division, the procedure division, how to handle files, input, output, program structure, looping, um, conditional statements, arithmetic expressions, data types, intrinsic functions with loads of examples, loads of labs, and loads of things to um, for you to tr as a learner for you to try to un really understand the concepts that were explained. Now, obviously, COBOL, if you want to write COBOL on a mainframe, if you want to compile that COBOL, you're going to need a mainframe. So as part of the, the course, IBM is actually providing anyone who wants to use the, the course material access to a mainframe that they can get a hold of completely free of charge with the um, code samples, the JCL already preloaded so they can um, go along and they can actually connect to a mainframe using the tooling that we, 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 we talk about in the course to try these samples out for themselves. So this means anyone from any part of the world can learn COBOL free of charge from a group of experts. The other guys were definitely experts, but I was involved, so that's why experts. And this course itself has it is now available. It's freely available, and it's talked about on the on the Open Mainframe Project site. And it's although it was started by a group of IBMers with collaboration from others, it's now been completely taken over by the Open Mainframe Project. So it is now completely community driven. And there are two follow on parts to the course, which the Open Mainframe Project is actively looking to get people to be involved in, to work with them, to produce those two other parts of the course but available to, uh, for you to learn COBOL with modern tooling. And there was just a joke. As I was um, finishing up on the course, obviously we were all now working remotely and I needed to make a change to one piece of the COBOL. So here's my COBOL on the left-hand side in VS Code, um, connected to a mainframe, but I needed to drop my wife off at the supermarket to do some essential shopping. So I was sat 
in my car with my MacBook tethered to my phone, editing COBOL in a modern editor, and the mainframe was on the other side of the Atlantic. And it was just that I, I know how networks work. I know this isn't a big thing, but this isn't your grandfather's COBOL. Just because it's COBOL doesn't mean that you can't be doing cool things like sitting in a car and writing COBOL on the other side of the Atlantic. This kind of stuff is, is obviously available. Within three days of the course being made live, we had this um, issue open in the GitHub from a guy called Negavan13 saying, well, it's not an issue, but I just want to show off. I've just run my first COBOL program ever in my life, and I'm so excited. How cool is that? That actually there are people who are willing to learn COBOL as a language for the first time, um, but they don't have to be on a university course to force them to do it. These are people picking up COBOL and learning it for themselves for the very first time. And I just thought that was really, really cool. So I wanted to share it. So as part of the course, um, IBM's taken the course material. We're going to be producing a Coursera video course that's going to be fronted by Jeff Bisty. Um, we're also doing COBOL Fridays, which is a series of YouTube um, events and Cisco WebEx events where you can join, again, free of charge uh, on a Friday. And we're just talking about, about a part of the COBOL language each Friday um, for people to um, find out more about COBOL. And that's all linked from the IBM developer site. And this solution is having an impact. The um, project itself has been starred and forked a load of times. The ZOpen editor, its download has spiked and now hits 8.3 thousand installs. The Zoe extension is just a little bit off 10 thousand installs. And the COBOL Friday videos um, that were based on the course material we delivered have now had 10 thousand views in total. So that was just my little story, but it was really humbling to actually be part of a solution and delivering a, a, a solution to a problem that's actually having a real global impact. And hey, if you want to write COBOL and want to learn COBOL, it's not a dying course. It's not a dying language. It actually drives modern enterprises. And now you can learn it for free using modern tooling. Thank you very much. Well, that was absolutely perfect. And your timekeeping was uh, impressive. Thank you so much for that. So, Mike, if you could pass control back to me, please, I shall do the intro to the Q&A. So on time wise, we are 20 minutes to the hour. So we're going to move into the more open mic Q&A session. We've also been joined by Captain Cobol, Tom Ross. Hey, Tom. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. Affirmative. Oh, good. Thumbs up. All oh, thumbs up. Excellent. <laughs> Technology. So again, folks, thank you so much for your patience. Hope we haven't had too many glitches. It seems to be working relatively smoothly, he says. Touching wood. And I think uh, I think you'll agree we've had some really, really, really impressive content from our speakers. Again, thank you so much for that. And from my perspective, even though I'm relatively new, I've been working on the mainframe now for about 18 months or so, although not a youngie. Um, that was a really, really, really great introduction. I haven't touched COBOL since the 1980s when I was at college. And that for me was a really good um, reminder, but also an introduction or reintroduction. So we, we've said all the way through, today is all about COBOL. I mentioned earlier on the session that we have a very active Slack channel. And what we've done within that is create a number of individual channels for specific areas of interest, including the hashtag COBOL, of course. It should be capitalized perhaps, but Slack doesn't do capital, I don't think. But we do have a specific sub-community focusing on, on COBOL. When I say sub-community, it's a growing sub-community. So it, please, please, please take the time, if you can, to join the Slack. And there are channels for everything. We're going to use that for the presentations after the event. We're also going to use that for um, specific content around COBOL. Now, one of my colleagues points out that Facebook runs on COBOL. Well, to be more clear, there is a COBOL programmers group on Facebook, 14,800 members. It says to me there's a little bit of activity there which builds on the work that uh, Will and the, and the folks have been talking about today. So thank you very much to Wolfram. Thank you to Robert. Thank you to Will. What we're now going to do is ask uh, Captain Cobol, who was with us a month or so ago, to step up to the mic along with our other three presenters, and we're going to go into a bit of an open Q&A. So, 
you can ask questions through the Slack chat, you can ask questions through the WebEx chat, or in the, in the absence of that, I've got some we prepared earlier. So should we get going? So any questions from those who'd like to speak or post them in the Slack, sorry, in the uh, WebEx? So David, we do have one in the Q&A in WebEx, and it's, it's actually for Robert. And it's for a developer new to the mainframe who has good who has good knowledge in Java. Would you recommend they try to learn COBOL or write their their own applications in Java? For example, what are the benefits of COBOL, and do they outweigh the learning curve? <clears throat> That's a great question, um, and I and I will freely admit that I'm going to be biased because I I don't know Java that well. But in my opinion, uh, it kind of depends on where your priorities lie. It, is your priority in delivering the function really quickly? In that case, I would probably stay with the language I'm most familiar with. But if I'm more concerned about performance and uh, that sort of thing, I would probably lean towards um, going with a compiled language like COBOL over Java, just because it tends to run a little bit better. But the COBOL is not impossible to learn. I mean, there's, there's, I've, I've learned so many languages over the years, I don't even remember which ones I know and which ones I don't know. But I would probably, uh, don't be afraid of COBOL just because it's unfamiliar. As, as someone who's done a lot of, has done some of both, uh, my opinion is that a, learning a language like COBOL is a whole lot easier for probably a lot easier for someone like you than it is for somebody old like me to learn Java. Does that help? That's great advice. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, may, may, may I uh, add my two cents? Please do, please. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is Tom Ross. Um, uh, the, the, um, it really depends on what you're writing your applications to do. Um, typically, if you're on mainframe, you're doing business processing, and COBOL has a bunch of advantages over Java in that area, performance being one of them, and the native ability to have uh, um, change from your pounds. <laughs> I, I, excuse my ignorance. I guess it's pounds and pence or something. I don't know what the, the euros and cents, dollars and cents. You can have decimal in all kinds of different data types built into the language. Java does not have that. You have to have an external class to fake out having decimal using floating point. So it's kind of doing business programming in Java is kind of a, a twist for the language. Now, if you're if you're coding uh, user interface code, then Java is far superior. But if you're doing the number crunching on the back end, uh, COBOL is is superior. And as as Robert said, it's going to outperform Java every time. Another thing I was just thinking about the other day is uh, if you're doing DB2 tuning, um, when you, you're looking at a hotspot, you have some application that has poorly written SQL and it's hogging all the DB2 cycles. If you're trying to track down the culprit, if it was written in Java, the culprit is the JVM, and you cannot find out which Java class is the CPU hog. In a compiled language, you can tell exactly which COBOL program contains the bad SQL, and you can fix it. So that's just a small piece of why you know COBOL is superior in that in large uh, business processing situations. That's really good advice. Thank you both. Um, I suppose I should ask the same question for Wol Wolfram and Will. Anything from you? Would you would you concur? Anything you'd add to that? Um, I would definitely concur with the point about COBOL um, supporting the um, decimal point and um, currencies um, kind of natively, which Java does not. It is very easy. Um, I would consider Java to be my one of my first kind of primary programming languages. And yet, um, having written some code recently that had uh, had to deal with a decimal and a currency and managing to screw that up. Um, yes, it's very easy to do and um, a lot harder um, to make those same, same mistakes in COBOL than it is Java. 
Yes, I also want to agree with uh, Tom's uh, um, ideas. And uh, many customers do, uh, who work with mainframes have a distinction between back-end programming and front-end programming. Front-end programming means uh, programming uh, web interfaces and so on. And back-end programming means to deal with uh, business and business logic and business programs. And I think uh, for back-end program, COBOL is very good suited. And uh, normally, when when people today say uh, COBOL is difficult, COBOL, uh, COBOL is not at all difficult. It's just another programming language. And anybody who understands how to program uh, in general and what, what are algorithms and so on, they can learn program in a very short time frame and uh, have a lot of possibilities to do back and uh, programming and backend programming maybe is much interesting than dealing with uh, nice web interfaces and so on so uh, COBOL is not a, a dying language in my opinion that's brilliant and that's one thing all... so go ahead nick we've got another question but i didn't mean to cut across you no worries. No, I was going. To, I was basically going to launch straight into that. So yeah, good, good point. Thank you, Nick. So yeah, I was just going to reiterate my opinion from what I've heard this evening. The there's definitely there's definitely a lot of life left in COBOL. So there's a couple more questions in the in the WebEx chats. So the first one is from I'm going to mispronounce your name. I'm sorry for that. But Ju, I'm going to say Julia Selman. I also wrote my first Hello World in COBOL. What advice can you give to a complete beginner? For COBOL programming. Now, my advice will be keep going. But what, what would the panelists say, Tom, etc.? Uh, that, yeah, it's a tough question. I don't know what it, I. Um, th there was also a question in the chat: How much time do I need to learn COBOL? Um, I uh, I taught myself COBOL when I joined IBM by writing a program to. Uh, read a bunch of records that I wrote by by hand in a QSAM file. Uh, with my weekly running mileage and to create a graph and get my average uh, weekly running mi uh, mileage and stuff. So I just I just started, I had an idea for something to do and I just read the manual and figured it out. And I have to say, I looked back at this program uh, a, couple, uh, a couple weeks ago and it was uh, the worst COBOL program I've ever seen, but it was, <laughs> it was my first one and I hadn't seen COBOL before. Um, but yeah, I would also just say, Keep going. Try try new things. Uh, use uh, you know. Try to use um, each of the basic COBOL statements. I mean, it's uh, it's really hard to stay awake while reading a language reference manual. Um, but if you do look through it and just say, well, I'm going to try out an inspect statement and see uh, what that does for me, uh, that could be a really good way to learn all the the details. For myself, uh, I often I get to know the COBOL language really well because I'm constantly responding to customer questions about problems they're having. Um, most recently, a customer needed to do uh, JSON parse uh, with the Boolean uh, uh, name value pair, and uh, and our par JSON parse in COBOL doesn't currently support uh, Boolean yet. I mean, we're working on it. We're shipping it soon. Um, but they tried to figure out a different way to do it uh, using non-JSON parse statements like inspect and unstring. And so uh, they had some ideas and I started trying it out and learned some things about inspect and unstring while doing that. So I'm in exploring customer situations, I'm constantly digging into really uh, minute details of the COBOL language and it's, uh, it's quite powerful. It's designed to make the programmer's job easier um, so it has a lot of power, but it also has a lot in it to learn. So just keep at it, I would say, would be my advice to learn it. Yeah, I would I would echo that. Uh, don't give up. You know, everyone who's ever learned the language and, and gone beyond just the superficial level, you've probably had the experience where you kind of have this um, revelation moment where you begin to think in that language. When you first start out, uh, uh, um, Lee Compton calls it Joe Ball, I think, where, where you're, you're trying to write Java, but you're still thinking COBOL. Well, that, that applies in all directions. You know, you'll tend to go with what you know, but every language has its strong points. COBOL's, one of COBOL's big ones 
is in its data structures, the way that you can define a record with fields and subfields and subfields to those subfields and handle them in all different kinds of ways, which is something that as far as I know, Java doesn't have at all. And so there are aspects to every language, you know, whether it's Rex or assembler or whatever you're working with that it does really well. And that's kind of native to the language. And there are some that it doesn't do so well. And you'll get to a point where you begin to realize the things about a particular language that make it really powerful. And uh, stick, stick with it until you get to understand those points. There's another question in the chat I see. Uh, how important uh, or is even crucial is to uh, learn JCL along with uh, COBOL. And my opinion is you don't need to have uh, much um, uh, learn about uh, JCL because especially when it comes to COBOL, you uh, call procedures and it's very easy. You don't have to define the JCL statements by yourself. You just uh, call a procedure. What is more important to get the interface into the school environment to, to see the uh, translations and the uh, possible problems that come up with uh, messages and so on. But with JCL, you don't have to deal too much. Brilliant. Thank you. But thank you for your feedback, folks. So we've got a few more questions in the q and a. I'm also conscious that we're running up towards the hour. We've got about six minutes to go. So let me just pick a couple, of, couple more from the Q&A session. So there's one specifically, do you see this, no, this is uh, from Indranil, Indranil. Do you see this skill gap in the UK, or where I am, as I don't seem to see a lot of COBOL programming jobs? So I guess that question will, and also any, other, any of the other organisers, do you see a gap in the UK for skills in COBOL? Yes, I, I definitely do. I've um, I've recently done a few searches. Not that I'm looking for um, any new opportunities. I'm quite happy where I am. Thank you very much. If if my IBM employees are, employers are listening to me, um, but I did do a search on Google um, for COBOL jobs based in the UK, and I got a huge amount back, um, varying from um, a whole range of different um, companies um, and uh, groups. Um, wanting to employ not just mainframe professionals, but in particular, COBOL professionals. So I do see that. I know um, internally in IBM, we've had um, some uh, external hiring slots and we've actually been hiring people externally from IBM into IBM. And, you know, if they've got COBOL on their CV, then that's something that we're interested in. So, um, yes, I, I do see a UK market for um, COBOL jobs. Maybe it's uh, how the search uh -huh. is done. <laughs> Could be. Yeah, it's a good point. And I guess the one of the benefits, again, plug for for the meetup and for the uh, for this group is that's why we're here. That's why we're trying to create these linkages between people looking for work and people actually hiring, not necessarily with acting as a recruitment agency, but come along to these sessions, join the Slack channels, meet up in real in real life or in virtual life with people who are working in this space and you never know what might come from that. So really great question and thanks thanks for the answers there, chaps. So I'll take one more question then I think we'll we'll move to wrap towards we'll move towards a wrap up. So there's a question from Vikas Pujar about uh, with Z ZTX container extensions coming into the picture, will that be limited to distributed technologies or see containers packaging COS applications, examples COBOL batch program, load modules. It's quite a specific question around the up. And again, I'm going to ask my colleagues here in IBM to, to throw in a, a thought here, but ZCX container extensions, will there be limited distributed technologies or containers, will it cover COBOL as well? So um, currently ZCX is um, limited to uh, distributed technologies. However, um, if you look at some of the things that I've been presenting on at share conferences um, over the past couple of years, we talk about using um, uh, can, can like a containerization technologies like ZOSPT and ZOSMF workflows to try to bring some of that containerization type technology to the core ZOS runtime. So I know it's an area that's being actively um, worked on um, and, and at least um, explored by um, different players in the in the community. That's perfect, thank you. Well, I appreciate that. So uh, what I'm gonna do, just close things out because I recognize we've got a couple of minutes left. So 
just jump through my so first, I mentioned already we have the um, Slack channel. So there's a there's a general channel on Slack as part of the main frame is meetupslack.com. So please, please, please join that. Use the general channel, but there's a specific channel themed around COBOL. And of course, we'll use that as a mechanism to communicate what's going on for the next meetup, the next meetup, the next meetup. Whether we do one next month, the month after, the month after that, it'll depend to some degree on what's happening with the, the lockdown and COVID-19, et cetera. But please, please, please come and join us. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the session, we're available on Meetup, of course. We're available on Slack. We're available on LinkedIn. And we're available on Twitter. So there are plenty of channels to communicate with Mainframer Z. And as I said right at the get-go, this is not an IBM only. This is open to the entire community. What we're trying to do, and we'll, we'll put it really well, as did our other uh, esteemed speakers, is we're trying to grow the community, encourage more people to develop more skills, but also to recognize that the barriers to entry are perhaps lower than you think. So the open mainframe initiative that Will talked about, the access to mainframe technology to get familiar with COBOL, the fact that COBOL runs in a development, phase, or a development way on other OS platforms as well, does give you more opportunities to get to get started. So please, please, please jump on in. So thank you all for your time. So thank you to our speakers especially. I really appreciate the effort you made in turning up today to, to Wolfram, to Robert, to Will, and to Tom. Thank you to the people who have joined us today, both in real life and on the uh, in, in the recording. Really, really, really appreciate your involvement. Let's get this community to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But again, thank you very much. Really, really, really appreciate your time. And I think that brings us to a close.